Hello everyone, thank you for joining uh, on your uh, valuable Sunday evenings. Um, hopefully you'll find this session useful. So um, my name is Alex Gordon, I'm an academic or specialist, whatever we're supposed to be called now, foundation doctor uh, as an F2 in the Peninsula Deanery, uh, currently based at Torbay Hospital um, in South Devon. Uh, and sort of, uh, I'm currently doing my academic year in um, medical education and also doing clinical work in um, stroke medicine currently. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, how to boost your CV, um, sort of obviously focusing on the sort of specialist foundation program because we're here, um, but also more so about sort of strategies for boosting your CV in general, um, as we'll go into. Um, my email's there. Um, also, give me a follow on Twitter. I'm relatively new and also LinkedIn if you're keen. Um, we just a couple of housekeeping things. If you can, just obviously make sure that you're on mute, uh, just to avoid general embarrassment and interruption. Um, stick any questions you have in the chat. Uh, and we've got a few of uh, the other committee members here. Uh, we've got Mayor Ayman, um, Zaha and uh, Hannah are around. Um, and yeah, hopefully um, you guys will find this handy. So first thing to say, pre-course questionnaire. Uh, if you haven't filled it in already, please make sure you fill it in. It's helpful for a few reasons. It's gonna help us um, try and identify any barriers to the AFP as part of research we're trying to do. Um, it will help us improve future webinars. It'll give you access to future webinars. If you fill it in, um, it will give you easier access to mock interviews with the current SFPs in preparation for your uh, preparation for your interview going forwards. And then hopefully, uh, as with me, you um, will stay on the email list and you'll be able to deliver talks like this, hopefully when you're an SFP in the future. Um, so yeah, give that... Um, Give that QR code a follow and uh, yeah. Um, so just in terms of the timeline, so this is the second of the webinars. You can see all our webinars on YouTube and also on previous year's webinars on the website, access to AFP.com. Um, this is uh, the one this week on boosting your CV. Last week, there was a really good introductory chat from lots of people from um, research uh, and sort of manage management AFP backgrounds. Um, just around sort of what the different AFPs involve across sort of Seven um, and Yorkshire and Peninsula. Um, but it's a it was a really good insight and it's something that I wish I definitely would have attended when I was at your stage. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, so we're just going to go briefly through the application process. Um, we're going to go through how points are scored for the AFP. Um, we're going to go through some practical tips for how to boost your CV in the AFP domain. So basically opportunities to boost your CV while you're still at uni. And I'll talk uh, in a sort of hopefully not too self-indulgent way about my personal experience. Then we'll have a good Q&A at the end with um, hopefully myself and the other moderators can chip in as well. Um, just to if anyone's got any sort of uh, to last lasting advice or questions. Um, so... Key messages from today. So if you're going to take anything away from today, I just want to go through this. So this talk is about, I sort of wanted to make it more about general CV building, not just for the sort of specialist foundation program, because I think we do slightly drift into this slightly unhelpful thing in medicine of making everything about box ticking when actually that's not really the point and also will only take you to a certain point in your career anyway before you sort of get quite fed up with it. The second point, and this is probably the absolute key one with all specialist foundation program applications, you do not need a conventionally good CV with lots of uh, like 10 million publications, presentations um, and prizes in order to get a specialist foundation program post. We all know plenty of people who get um, sort of fairly well perceived prestigious SFP posts who have almost or absolutely no publications, presentations or additional degrees at all. Um, obviously that comes with a bit of nuance, but you absolutely do not need to have that standard stuff on your CV. Um, it's not a guarantee that you will get an SFP post um, at all. Um, the other key message is really is make sure that when you are building your CV, just follow your interests and then use that to build your CV as a byproduct. Don't do stuff just for the sake of building your CV. And likewise, view the Specialist Foundation Program as a waypoint to a future career. Don't view it as the end goal of your CV building, because again, that sort of will lead to the similar problems to the above point. I think the bottom one is probably my most important one. Um, so focus on doing the stuff you enjoy as part of the journey, and then ultimately you will just drift towards a destination that is satisfying based on the stuff that you already do that you enjoy. 
And I think having working towards what you perceive as a prescribed interest in your own heads for 20 years time, uh, when sort of there will be so many life changes from sort of med school to being a consultant, um, is probably less helpful than sort of making sure that you just do stuff that you enjoy and that you find interesting and then seeing where that takes you from there, really. So just in terms of the high level UKFP timeline, so just to go through what's going on this year. So registration window on Oriel opens in a couple of weeks on the 25th of August. So everyone needs to sign up then. Then you have the application window. So obviously you register and you put your personal details in. The application window for all of the foundation programs, so academic or specialist foundation program, normal foundation program, and the foundation priority program, the window is open from the 7th to the 20th of September. Um, and then after you've sent in the applications, the foundation schools or the deaneries will um, go through whatever selection process that deanery goes through from the 21st of September to the 30th of December. Um, and then the offers get released in sort of rounds from the 11th of January. And then they essentially get through multiple rounds with the final rounds finishing on the 10th of February. Um, where can you go in the UK? There's 20 uh, specialist foundation program deaneries. They do differ a little bit, uh, I think off the top of my head, from the structure of the normal deaneries. Um, but um, all of these sort of uh, information on all of the deaneries is available on the Access the AFP website. Um, so, yeah, so we'll just go through what's actually involved in the application and what's. Um, yeah like i say what's what's actually involved in sort of point scoring as it is um so first thing you've got is the deadline is september the 20th this year so um educational performance measure so that's your decile that will by the time you get to your the end of your penultimate year that will be predetermined um already and uh because they've removed the educational achievements of extra degrees and publications um from all scoring this year that is a score between 41 and 50 50 being the maximum, obviously. Then you have additional achievements. So this is specific to the Specialist Foundation Programme, although they've removed additional degrees and publications for regular Foundation Programme applications, they still are very much in the mix. So additional degrees, you can have up to two, and then prizes, presentations, and publications, you can have 10 of each. And then you have your white space questions. So these 200 words, sort of uh, mini personal statements that fit under a domain. And we've got a webinar coming up on that in a couple of weeks as well. Then once you fill all that in, you, you will probably, if you've attended all this, meet the uh, publication, uh, the interview criteria and then go for an interview. And then after your interview, uh, you hopefully get an offer. Uh, so yeah, this is this sort of stuff in the red circle is really what we're gonna talk about today. If you're struggling to decide where to go, uh, go to head over to accessdafp.com. We have, because um, some of it is quite difficult to sort of dig out for each deanery, but there's website links to each of the academic units of application uh, web pages and uh, head over there. Um, and it will also tell you what type of uh, academic foundation program is available, uh, how many vacancies there are, um, and sort of give you a bit more insight into competition ratios um, and that side of things. So the first question really is what what makes a good medical CV? Um, and I think so this is all taken from a BMJ paper from 2011 on how to write a good CV. But I think realistically when you're when you're thinking through it, obviously, although you do want to be a specialist foundation program doctor, the key the key bit really for being a good doctor is obviously clinical skills and experience. Um, and I think if anything, it's just I just wanted to make this point that it is bearing in mind that. First and foremost, although we are all trying to do academic stuff on top, we are all doctors and it is still important to make sure that you're not sacrificing clinical work and clinical ability and the ability to treat patients for um, all this other stuff that's obviously a great on top. But um, ultimately, you are a doctor first and foremost and you do need to be able to look after patients. Um, but in terms of the other stuff, um, it's basically proving that long term, the Specialist Foundation Programme and its domains of management and leadership or research um, or sort of teaching experience all sort of is encapsulated in making a good medical CV. So if you're in any doubt about the Specialist Foundation Programme, I would certainly apply just for the long-term benefits of all the way up to consultant, it being considered a really helpful thing to have on your CV uh, in terms of the skill set. But it's just trying to prove that sort of 
Uh, this slide is sort of trying to go through, yes, the domains of the specialist foundation programme are important, but it's also the most important thing is making sure that your clinical skills and experience are up to scratch. I had a meeting with um, a sort of academic mentor recently who said, actually, I'd recommend if you do want to do an academic clinical fellowship, um, I'd recommend you actually get a bit more medical sort of medical experience on the wards before you go for it, just because of the additional time that is required in the academic bit and the potential skill fade associated. Um, and then it's also just making sure you have some personal interest as well. Um, but we'll go through that in a little bit. So what are the deaneries actually looking for? Um, this is all sort of fairly par for the course stuff that we've already covered. So it's additional degrees. So you've got two spaces to put those in. Um, most people, um, a lot, well, a lot of people with specialist foundation program application intentions will have intercalated. But like I said, it's not essential and it's not a guarantee that you'll get an offer. Um, and then you've got 10 spaces each with presentations, publications and prizes. And then your EPM score will be put in on Oriel by your medical school. Um, there is a separate process if you're an international graduate, um, but I'm not too clued up on that, unfortunately. Um, so in terms of, we'll just go through sort of additional degrees and um, all the sort of routine stuff first, and then I'll sort of talk through my sort of personal experience and views on um, sort of how to really optimise your CV. So in terms of the additional degrees, so the, what you've got at the top here on the left is the, uh, I believe this is from the Northwest Deanery. So all the sort of scoring stuff is taken from the Northwest Deanery um, and not all um, deaneries will score the same, but it's just that the Northwest is very transparent in what they want. Um, additional degrees. So you can see that if you do, if you get a third class degrees to them progress, uh, you don't get any points in your application. A T2 is one point, a T1 is two points. And if you get first class or an MSc or an MRes, which are all achievable within one year of intercalation, um, you get five points. Uh, I think if anyone is currently intercalating, it's just really important to try and chase your admin teams early and just make it really clear that you, you are applying for a job. I certainly had to do that with my intercalation and it was all fine, but it's just getting in there early with them. Um, I think obviously you can, there are some medical schools offering an intercalated PhD, but ultimately the difference in points between them, um, five points and 10 points, a PhD is a long, long time. It's probably going to be three, four years. Um, and ultimately, as we'll go through, a five point difference uh, could easily be made up by doing things like publication presentations and um, posters rather than dedicating an extra three, four years of sort of um, your time there's also a few I mean there's a few threads on this on things like Twitter uh, and Reddit if you're that way inclined around sort of the pros and cons of doing a PhD this early in your training um, and uh, that's sort of beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today um, but it's just uh, it's something that if you're really thinking about a PhD I'd recommend having a really in-depth chat with an academic or sort of mentor about the pros and cons of that um, I think um, just in terms of sort of additional degree stuff, um, the intercalation, I have to say, is having done it, I found it an incredibly valuable experience. It's the one time you will get very, very significant levels of funding to undertake an area of interest in a taught degree at a potentially master's level. Um, although lots of postgraduate stuff is, um, there are lots of these sort of clinical fellow jobs with postgraduate certificates being offered. Um, they are becoming now so mainstream that it's almost being seen as the norm in this sort of academic inflation phenomenon. Um, I would recommend if you are interested in academia, um, pursuing an intercalated degree, if you haven't already, just like I say, it's like a really good opportunity to take some time out, get quite a lot of funding to do something and do something that's not your primary medical degree. Um, but like I say, there are all these sort of F3 level posts where there are postgraduate certificates and things like education that are self-funded. Um, but like I said, it's not an essential requirement for a specialist foundation programme post at all. Um, but I think the main point is only, please only do an additional degree if you are genuinely interested and passionate about the subject. I certainly had a friend who uh, did a integrated degree in clinical education for a year because he knew it would be important for his surgical application and um, absolutely hated it because he wasn't interested at all and felt like that ultimately he'd um, sort of wasted a year when actually he could have enjoyed it a lot more. So I think it's very important to highlight it's only 
please only do an additional degree if you're genuinely interested in the topic because it's not worth spending an entire year of and there is a financial cost with it as well and you're not going to graduate at the same time as your sort of mates at uni um only do it if you're genuinely very interested in the topic but if you are genuinely interested it's such a good opportunity um to undertake an area of study that you're really interested in get some really really good um sort of cv building done on the top right here i've just got i've just uh, sort of cropped the eligibility criteria for um academic clinical fellowship posts which are um, the sort of uh, after the sort of core training equivalent of a specialist foundation program where you do academic work alongside core training and whatever run through um, or core training program you're going to do. Um, and I think it's just as desirable criteria, it does say if you so, for example, it's sort of any uh, having done a clinical neuroscience degree, if I wanted to go on and do sort of uh, academic clinical fellowship in neurology, having an MSc in clinical neuroscience is obviously going to be hugely helpful for that. Um, and it does sort of raise quite a lot of um, sort of eyebrows in a good way to have done a sort of intercalated masters. I think if you do have the funding, and it's not, I mean, it's not essential, and this may just be my point of view as this whole presentation is, but I think the uh, skill set now that the um, sort of generic foundation program have removed the requirement for additional degrees, I think the skill set you get from a master's degree over a bachelor's degree in terms of the extended focus on independent project work and producing a full sort of um, master's dissertation uh, and also being able to do a full degree in a year rather than trying to do um, the third year of a bachelor's that other people are on has sort of quite significant advantages over doing a bachelor's but this sort of downside with masters is they are sort of potentially more expensive um, but like I say, there are all these postgraduate certificates as that you can do as an F3 uh, plus that you can then go on to sort of uh, fund all the way up to a full sort of master's degree. Um, postgraduate certificates being the sort of first third of sort of most master's degrees, really. I'm happy to have a chat with anyone about um, that in more depth if anyone's got any questions on that. Next is sort of presentations. So um, obviously, as you've got a maximum of 10 for all of these domains. I think, although it says, so this is again taken from the Northwest Deanery, so about oral presentations. Um, I think if you're just starting, local presentations are still very helpful for building experience and presenting and gaining contacts. Ultimately, anything you do that has an output is a beneficial experience, I think. And I wouldn't be dismissive of local presentations, even if they don't count for points. As is sort of the whole point of my presentation is if you're just doing it for the points, you're probably in it for the wrong reason. Um, and like I say, um, so this in the Northwest is its own thing and not everywhere will market the same, but obviously an oral presentation on anything at an international level is going to be viewed more highly than um, sort of at a national level and then over a regional level. Um, the key thing with all of this stuff is just making sure that you have um, written evidence of even a, either a certificate or something um, or a letter that's written by your supervisor that says that you did it. Um, and evidence for that as well. It's also helpful to have pictures taken of you doing it just so you can stick it in a portfolio at a later stage. Um, and so uh, people, apparently the interviewers quite like it as sort of core training interviews if they've actually got a visual picture of you having delivered something and it gives them something to remember you by before you walked into the interview as well. Um, so um, I think the, that sort of comes down to the, the sort of next point really try to get every project you do sort of presented at least regardless of how good quality you personally believe it is you will be surprised i think if you do end up attending national conferences at some of the quality that is being presented um by senior colleagues i attended a conference recently where a poster was um a blank sheet of paper with a, one single paragraph and a table on it and it was a complete blank white sheet and that got presented at a national conference now I don't want to, that's not a sort of criticism as such, but I was just sort of surprised at this sort of bare bones nature of it. Um, I think just at the end of the day, don't, don't sell yourself short. If you've done some work, um, the output is key really. So get on and try and uh, try and present it somewhere, even if that's just a local thing. Um, or there's, if you're involved in things like medical education, there is the sort of um, jasmine type 
uh, conference coming up in Nottingham in October, and also things like the National Inspire conferences uh, for sort of student-led research. Um, I think presentations being given in future could still be appropriate on an application. Um, so just mention it. If you don't mention it, you just sold yourself short. Um, and also just with presentations, just remember that that will also count as, um, uh, that also could potentially count for a prize as well. So if you get a prize for a presentation, that would count as both a prize and a presentation. So enter it in both domains. Like I say, don't sell yourself short on these applications. Um, publications, I think this is probably the trickiest one to try and get nailed as a student, uh, just because uh, the process of getting published is pretty laborious. It takes a long time. Um, it normally takes several months to go from submitting to getting stuff published unless um, you can get on an inside track with a supervisor who essentially has a commissioned article. Um, PubMed ID is important, but it's not, as we go, we'll go into, I, I'm not convinced that it is completely essential for AFP, but it obviously is um, for the Northwest Deanery because it says that uh, you get seven points and 10 points for PubMed indexed. But if you look at four points, it just says it needs to be indexed in a database somewhere. Um, and like I say, you can still get two points for uh, middle authorship on a research publication that is somewhere. It doesn't have to be PubMed ID. So still try and sell your non-PubMed ID stuff, but just prioritize the PubMed ID stuff. Um, I think in terms of having had a chat with people um, and sort of my own experience, letters to the editors for things like medical education journals, um, lots of people submit that stuff as students. I certainly did it um, with a couple of my sort of uh, friends from my year um, commenting on a couple of articles around um, sort of problem-based learning, having been to a problem-based learning university. Um, whether that was just to get points or not uh, is uh, what I will leave up to you to decide from this uh, talk, but uh, it was still a valuable insight into the publication process, but I wouldn't, I think it will raise a lot of eyebrows if you had just essentially spammed letters to the editors left, right and centre and your entire publication CV was letters to the editors of education journals. I think people would start asking a few questions, but I think a couple is, um, sort of a helpful insight into the process, but I wouldn't try and wrap that up. Case reports are, um, they don't take that long to write, just have, um, there's a few things you need to do with consent, but if you're interested and you've seen an interesting case, just have a chat with your consultant if you're on a particularly prolonged um, clinical placement um, of sort of six to 10 weeks, that's a perfectly reasonable time frame to get a case report written in conjunction with your sort of clinical supervisor on placement. Um, Short reports and full scientific papers are a bit sort of, um, I think you're realistically going to be able to get those if you've done a dedicated something like a research elective or um, have it intercalated and then can push for your um, dissertation to get published. But uh, it would be, I think you, you're going to be limited to one or two, one or two of those, um, unless you've got sort of other other research work going on or you're at a uh, university that has a particularly strong research profile. I think the thing to say with publications is they're very high effort with potentially a low output. And I think uh, the question is like with those letters, the editors I spoke about, can you collaborate with friends on their outputs to increase your own output? So um, if for intercalated degrees or other stuff at the moment, um, I did a systematic review um, for uh, my dissertation. And I collaborated with one of my uh, mates from uni. And then in return, um, I was also sort of the second sort of um, author on his by reviewing the sort of papers on his um, systematic review that he was doing on a separate project. So it's sort of just try and get some sort of reciprocal relationship going with people that you know to try and increase the sort of yield. Because at the end of the day, it's sort of publication is very difficult and there is a lot of stuff does get rejected and you just have to be braced for that. It's like I say, I would maybe try and look at getting things like poster presentations and prizes if possible, just because it will be quicker for ramping up your CV than sticking everything on, putting loads and loads of effort into a publication that might not necessarily 
get published but obviously if you, any publication is great and it will help you down the line as well having publications that you've done at university how do i get involved with research projects um is a sort of good is a good question so a student selected components um if you can follow up on things if you've worked with a supervisor who you got on really well with in one of those um or have you done a sort of literature review as part of that that you can extend into a sort of publication self-organized projects with things like um inspire or just like i said just trying to approach clinical supervisors that you have quite prolonged contact with can be really helpful but we'll just go into the sort of pros and cons in a little bit of trying to self-start your own project um certainly just try and have a, a lot of sort of registrars and stuff coming towards um cct or becoming consultants will need to start increasing their research output um so if you can make sort of contact with any of them um or sort of surgical trainees are often trying to get lots of audits done so it's just trying to make contacts with people you get on well with on placement um intercalated degrees like i said um or your elective there's a few um you can certainly i know people that have done electives and sort of bethesda in the us on sort of research projects um can you do an all data quality improvement project that's currently going on in a medical department there's lots of people asking do posters presented at the multiple conferences just count as one and the answer is no uh, i would present multi i would try and present at multiple conferences uh, and it also increases the chance of getting prizes as well uh, the only thing to be aware of is you might get called out for plagiarism if you submit the same well if you do submit the same abstract to multiple conferences you will get done for plagiarism so don't submit the same abstract but presenting the same work um, or the same body of work is completely valid and i've certainly done that with some of my publications as well inspire is uh certainly where i was at plymouth uh was run as a sort of um inspire at um is a sort of national thing run by the academy of health sciences that's really good for publications um uh but and sort of getting involved in sort of wet lab research projects um but there's certainly some people have had really really good outcomes from that and it's quite good for building contacts as well i think i put twitter on here med twitter and following people that are really high up in sort of um academic fields is quite helpful because they often post things like ongoing conferences a lot of which are online and you can attend um a lot of them are, were quite low cost certainly with neuroscience um i attended i've managed to attend a couple of sort of traumatic brain injury and uh, the brain conference which i both managed to come across on twitter and it sort of gave me a good insight into what was going on in the field and then was able to have a chat with a supervisor about related research projects um you can do paid internships but i think the important thing is really just ask and like i say if you get on with someone in a clinical environment and you're interested in the field what's the worst that's going to happen if you ask um the other thing as well is just keeping up to date with the field because it is helpful if you ask someone that to show that you have an awareness and you are keen by showing that you've read around and you are up to date with the field is um you can get email alerts for loads and loads of sort of journals and most universities do have access um to the sort of high level journals of like the lancet the new england journal of medicine um which and the bmj which will post the sort of really high level stuff in your field but also just following the sort of subspecialty journals with a high impact factor you also if you can show a potential supervisor that you know what's going on in the field and you're aware of the current controversies and you have an idea for a research project um, that they can ship in with um, that's a really good way of getting your foot in the door uh, there are lots of collaborative research things online and this has exploded kind of since covid um, especially with a lot of focus with the way evidence-based medicine is going on sort of agglomerating research and things like systematic reviews lots of if you're very surgically inclined this slide is for you um, things like star surge euro surge global surge um uk clinical research collaboration student training and research collaborative there's all sorts of stuff remarks burst uh who did a sort of uh project recently looking at sort of urology education undergraduate stuff academics uh academic surgical collaborative apologia um national student association of medical research and uh nansig um if you're feeling bold enough and you do all that sort of journal reading and stuff and you know sort of who the big dogs in your field are that you're sort of interested in why why not just send them an email and ask i just say 
um, do you have any sort of ongoing work that I could collaborate on remotely? Can I have a chat with you about sort of ways to get involved um, and that sort of thing? And the worst they can, the worst thing they'll do is ignore you or say no. And the sort of best thing that could possibly happen is they say, yeah, uh, we're looking for someone to help out as a sort of data collector for this systematic review um, or whatever. So um, why not just give them a give them a bell if you are keen? The worst thing that will happen is they say no, and the best thing that will happen is you'll engage in a sort of career changing project. So next, uh, next thing we'll talk about is prizes. So you have a maximum of 10 prizes. Prizes from conferences counts, although uh, just to say prizes under the AFP thing also comes under the umbrella of merit and distinction. Um, so I, in mine, chucked in lots and lots of distinctions on individual university modules. Um, so if you if you know that you've won some of those, um, try and get letters from your admin staff at unions. If you are coming up to applying, I would try and chase them from now. Um, Prizes from conferences, again, like we said, if you present the same project at multiple conferences, but obviously not plagiarizing the exact same work, but presenting sort of different perspectives on the same data set or have built on data sets across multiple months, um, and you get multiple prizes, that counts. Um, like I said, don't, as I said already, don't short sell yourself. If you think it might count, it's on the universities to disqualify you, not, don't disqualify yourself. Essay prizes. So the Royal Society of Medicine has essay prizes available for students. Um, surprisingly few people enter those. So have a look. Um, also just have a look at the Royal Colleges or faculties or whatever you're interested in um, on their website. So if you're interested in emergency medicine, have a look on the Royal College of Emergency Medicine website. Uh, if you're interested in neurology, the Association of British Neurologists has prizes available. Um, and just work from there to see if you can build up a prize. Mini grant awards. So if you get engaged with stuff like Inspire um, or you're interested in lab research, I've managed to get uh, I managed to get one from the Wellcome Trust. It was like a summer research internship where they gave you quite a lot of funding to just sort of um, put towards your living costs um, to, to engage in a summer research project. University unit prizes. So all those student selected components do do count. Um, OSCE prizes again, and then Royal Society prizes, like we said, and that were, it may include first, second, and third. Like I said, if you get second place in something, um, I would still stick that on your application. Uh, and again, I've just copied and pasted the Northwest stuff on here. So an academic prize within the curriculum of the MBCHB will count. Um, an extracurricular prize. So um, if you win sort of best student society member of the year, stick that on there. Why not? Or, or the worst thing they can do is say no. And then uh, you can get a, the obviously more prestigious prizes that are going to be counted for academic applications. It's going to be stuff that's directly awarded on a regional or national or even international level. Um, international, the definition is sort of if, if the conference is advertised sort of outside of the UK, but it can still happen in the UK. You don't need to fly far, far away to like America or sort of Australia to present at an international conference. If it's an international thing that's done on UK soil that will still count. Um, so I think I, I want to talk about my CV and my experience and sort of my sort of 10 top tips really for boosting your CV for the Specialist Foundation programme. Um, just because I don't, I personally don't believe that my CV was actually sort of incredible for an SFP and I certainly had this sort of hijinks in my mind of like I'm competing with all these like people that have gone to like um Oxford and Cambridge that have done like five million extra degrees and have uh, working with like Nobel Prize winners and they're cracking out publications every day but it's just not it's just not true and I think we all probably undersell ourselves quite a lot um and it's just um make just being confident in yourself that you you do have a right to apply regardless and even if your CV doesn't have that much on it it doesn't matter like it, the applying for the SFP takes nothing away from your normal foundation program application so the worst that will happen is you just won't get anywhere and then you just do a normal foundation program and then you're still free to do research alongside that anyway um so my CV was um I did I, I integrated in clinical neuroscience at King's as a master's degree um I did pretty well at uni I was in the first decile um but in terms of my, my CV was a bit sort of lackluster in the research domains um I had sort of one 
conference presentation I'd done, and that was just at a local level in Plymouth on a Wednesday afternoon uh, to some other undergraduate students. Um, and then I had sort of two letters to the editor that we'd sort of written fairly hastily to try and get those two extra points on the sort of normal foundation program thing, which is, to be honest, why, why they probably removed that domain, because so many people were just getting really poor quality outputs. And I'd also done a systematic review for my um, dissertation at King's that the protocol was published that I did submit. Because like I say, I don't, there's nothing that specifically says you have to have it. And I don't think it would have been counted, but I put it on just in case. And then I had um, some prizes. So I got a distinction in my master's. Um, I had two end of year prizes for sort of performance best in the year on sort of medical knowledge. I'd got a grant prize from the Wellcome Trust, but I also just had like year one, year two best student selected component like score from having done a couple of 2000 word essays. Um, and I managed to uh, amass about five of these, which were made up nine of my prizes. But obviously, if you end up with more, I would just um, like I say, just go back through this presentation and look at what's counted more. And that's obviously going to be prizes that are won at international conferences are going to count for much more than your first year SSU on medical humanities. Um, so but like it, like I say, if you are sort of scratching your head and you're like, well, I don't have international stuff, that's fine. You can still submit stuff. Um, and all it's going to do is add, um, don't disqualify yourself. I think the only caveat to this is about tactical application. Um, apply for places, places that suit your strengths. So if you have no research output whatsoever, I would say, and, and you have long-term dreams of being a researcher at Oxford and Cambridge, that you can still achieve that. It's just not, it's probably and almost definitely not going to happen at academic foundation program level that you're going to get um, a research application, but still getting an academic foundation program elsewhere and using the extra time that gets allotted, as we spoke about last week, to do research in the domain um, of the sort of area of interest that you're gearing towards is still absolutely fine. So um i sort of with my interest in neuroscience although i'm doing a medical education afp um having wanted to get a research afp i'm still sort of doing clinical neuroscience research with um a supervisor in plymouth and that's that's still completely valid to do um i think in terms of my strategy i think and people may disagree with this this is just where i went i was like there's no point in not applying to the place that i want to go which was i wanted to go to cambridge to do neurointensive care um and um i think um uh, and so i sort of applied there on a sort of whim knowing that i wouldn't get it but then i applied to the southwest which is my more pragmatic application and the reasons for that is the southwest if you apply is both peninsula and seven under the under one deanery umbrella so i was like that's technically really two for the price of one i would be able to sell myself above other candidates at interview due to already being a student here um, and I sort of knew that from speaking to people locally, there was quite a high degree of independence. So you can still engage in other projects you want. So with the medical education AFPs, um, the one here is you get funding to do a postgraduate certificate in education at either Plymouth University or Exeter University. Um, but other than that, what you do is very much self-directed and up to you uh, to approach supervisors. Um, but I think as long as you prove that you've done something, which obviously being a specialist foundation program candidate and being on this webinar, you are self-motivated to do stuff. Um, it's what you want to do, really. So I'm engaged in a few sort of systematic reviews around sort of medical education and, and engage with this sort of stuff as well. Ultimately, in terms of what you think your dream job you want to do for the SFP may take longer to get to. So again, it's about the journey versus destination. Uh, and it may take you a bit, several years to get to where you want to be, but ultimately you'll have had richer experiences and um, there's nothing worse than turning out to what you think might be your dream sort of job and then discovering that it's actually really hard work and not, not very fun at all. Um, and I'm actually very glad I got a sort of education AFP in the end. Um, in terms of tactical application, I think the one thing that would be a bit silly is not looking at the person specifications. So, um, for example, so this is, if, like I say, this is on the Access to AFP website, um, but um, it would be a bit silly to apply to a deanery that you're absolutely not going to get into. So, for example, the Southwestern 7 one for this year is you have to have an EPM decile score of 44. Um, there are sort of idiosyncrasies by deanery. 
Um, so just make sure that when you are applying somewhere, just have a look at their person specification and make sure that you're not going to be immediately invalidated and all your hard work is going to have gone to waste. I think I just want to talk about tips for really sort of rapidly ramping up your CV. Um, and this is sort of applicable for everyone, really. Um, because I think if, if you're here, like I say, you're clearly interested in academia long term, as well as the specialist foundation program. Um, and I think obviously, if you're applying for the specialist foundation program, the cycle, the, sh the ship has uh, as as hardworking as you are. I don't think you're you're going to be able to get anything else in your CV in the next sort of four weeks. Um, I was generally very frustrated at my university. I thought that I well, and everyone has sort of agreed in my cohort that that they'd essentially provided no support and it obscured all sort of specialist foundation program um, sort of type things um, from view really at very early stages. No one had talked to us about the importance of it. And we only all sort of really started clocking it quite late on in sort of penultimate year or intercalation. Um, and it sort of frustrated me a lot that it sort of, I felt that there were sort of three or four years of time that hadn't, that had sort of not, where stuff could have been done where it just hadn't been done because of that but i have managed to sort of rapidly improve my cv within a year of in sort of my fifth year of medical school and over the course of f1 as well while i was doing full-time clinical work so i'll just talk basically about what i did and how i did it really so what i did was um i chased up my intercalation dissertation um which I'd done, and I managed to get that presented at the Brain Conference uh, in March, the year after I'd done it, which was an international online conference. So online conferences will still count. Uh, like I say, you don't, you can do an international conference from your own bedroom if you want. Obviously, being a presenter probably doesn't cross that well if you're in your pajamas and your pants, but um, it still counts as an international conference. Uh, sort of in a weird bit of serendipity, and this comes up all the time. Um, my academic tutor that was allocated in my fifth year of med school was the head of the British Association for the Study of Headache, who knew my dissertation supervisor. So that was quite helpful for introductions and saying, look, I want to continue doing work on this domain. And I've managed to work uh, mainly around sort of um, headache service provision and sort of around evidence based uh, care for headaches as part of that um, and then carrying on with sort of projects since and sort of slowly taking those over. Um, I approached an ICU consultant in Plymouth who was involved in neurointensive care uh, and I managed to get on board with having said, look, I'm interested in applying for this, um, but I know that you've done some work with the guys at Cambridge before. Have you got any work that you're interested in? And the consultant was like, yeah, actually, um, we want to have a look at our sort of why we don't feed people in acute spinal cord injury because we don't think our protocol actually makes any sense. So I did a literature review for them presented it at their sort of uh, lunchtime teaching and then managed to get it to an international conference again, which was done from home. Um, opportunistic audit work. So I then went on to a psych patient in my fifth year and um, the trainees there were just working on a sort of uh, quality improvement project around cardiometabolic risk monitoring in psychiatric patients. Um, and they were struggling a bit with the data. So I just offered to help them out and said, look, I've done my master's, I've done a bit of sort of research statistics on that. They said, fair enough, jump on board. And then we managed to get a poster presented at an international conference that was fairly minimal work, actually, from my point of view. Um, and just sort of club, like a few hours, just putting data together. And we managed to get a poster at an international conference. Um, I approached the teacher at uni who worked with the NIHR for having, uh, doing stuff around teaching evidence-based practice and said, look, I've done a systematic review as part of my master's. Um, I'm quite keen to teach this stuff. Um, and he was like, yeah, sure, come on board. And since then, we just carried on working on it. And I'm due to attend a sort of course, a fully funded course in Oxford as a result of that. And I also have offered to help with sort of content for Geeky Medics and Mind the Bleep. Anyone who uh, has watched any of the Mind the Bleep neurology webinars, uh, I was the one coordinating those as well. Um, and you can coordinate content for Geeky Medics as well. And if you have that stuff, and you say, look, I've, I've engaged with this free online access med ed content. People can look at it and go, OK, so you are king in this domain. Um, and then that's another way to get your foot in the door. Um, so it's just sort of following, actively approaching people, um, sort of taking advantage of stuff you've already done and sort of selling yourself to people based on skill sets that you have. So two years later, my CV was looking much better, much, much better, all because of essentially uh, opportunism and being quite proactive and having sort of a skill set to sell people. And I think um, opportunity, as I'll go on to, opportunity really begets opportunity. So as soon as you get your foot in the door with one thing, suddenly and loads and loads of opportunities start opening up in front of you. Um, but it's just taking those first steps and um, 
trying to engage in stuff that you're interested in and all it takes is that one sort of breakthrough project and suddenly all this stuff starts almost sort of falling in your lap really um i just want to go through my sort of 10 top tips quickly and then we can do a q a um don't don't undersell yourself in your application um so i i actually can't find any explicit criteria that state that afp publications must have pubmed id and that's clearly not a prerequisite um Conference presentations don't have to be international slash national. They can be regional, they can be local, um, and they might still count. But like I say, don't obscure that. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to want something to count. You don't have to want first to count something out as a prize. If you get a distinction or a merit, or it says distinction or merit, and you sort of still got space, stick it in your application because it's only going to gain you more points. It's on the deaneries to exclude your achievements, not you. Um, but like I said, please just obviously prioritize international or sort of more prestigious achievements first. Um, I think it, in terms of sort of other stuff, try to get some form of output regardless of what it is, regardless of you think, if you think your audit is the worst audit ever, um, still try and present it because someone will still probably want to see it. And ultimately a lot of conferences just want sort of posters on the boards. Um, but just obviously with your stuff, the, the only caveat to this is, Obviously, do not completely falsify your achievements um, and make sure you have physical evidence to back up what you've said. Otherwise, you'll run into hot water with sort of property issues uh, and potential GMC referrals. But as long as you know in yourself that you actually did the work and that you haven't completely overly embellished what you did, sell it. Uh, it's only going to gain you points. The box ticking only tells half the story, sort of tip two. And there's this quote from Doug Altman, who's a sort of famous statistician and researcher um, that was about sort of dodge this is the only one I could find. Um, but basically, lots of medical research is, is rubbish. And I think there's other quotes that so sort of 99% of published medical research is absolute nonsense and is normally completely wrong. But we, we, we need less research. I think this is right, less research, better research and research that's done for the right reasons rather than box ticking on CVs. Um, and I think actually, if you don't enjoy research, that's fine because ultimately, well, we're all here for sort of SFP stuff. So education, leadership and management are all completely valid as well. And so engaging in near peer teaching, doing leadership and management stuff. So audits and QI is obviously fine, but doing society work or voluntary work and taking a sort of major lead in things like national charities will still well, obviously, if you find that will obviously be hugely rewarding for you um, and will still stand out on if it's not in the sort of box taking bits of the AFPCB white space question wise. If someone can see that you were the sort of national lead for a charity that you were really engaged with, that's still going to really make you stand out. Non-medical jobs as well. So we had George um, Avril last week, who's one of the other academic foundation trainees down in Torbay who had done previous sort of care home management work. And that still was very helpful for his application. And also extracurricular stuff and personal interest as well, some of which I've shamelessly put on the right. So I referee rugby in the community and I'm currently about to start embarking on a sort of national level new award for that. And then also I set up the medic review at my uni and that still helped on my CV and uh, will still be helpful at sort of interviews. So ultimately everyone is the same on a cv at the end of the day more or less once they get to interview and actually this will make you stand out more as a candidate and probably give you a much more enjoyable much more rich experience than trying to submit 20 million letters to the editor and sort of various poor quality publications um if um to try and relentlessly box tick to try and desperately get an sfp post um so i think it's just making sure that you're doing everything that you do uh, for the right reasons rather than just relentlessly box ticking Tip three, and we had a discussion about this yesterday, um, me and a couple of the other sort of um, guys in the committee, is just be a finisher. People like people who finish projects. Make sure that when you work with supervisors that you are proactive in showing them that you are trying to do the work and you are trying to finish. And if you run into stumbling blocks, tell them about it because they'll be able to help you rather than just sort of abandoning it. Um, try to finish the projects you start um, at the sort of output stage because uh, it gets you better buy-in from supervisors and you're more likely to continue projects and you need to be like a terrier is one of the sort of bits of advice I was given and if a supervisor is being a bit lax just chase them and chase them and chase them because um, if they are sort of dragging their heels a little bit because if it, there's there's nothing worse than sort of having put in loads of work and then it sort of 
gets held up at the end of sort of a supervisor sort of dragging their heels with it. So just chase and chase and chase. At the end of the day, it's in your best interest. But the other thing is, and the, the sort of other side of that coin really is don't overcommit yourself. So have a, however long you think a task will take, at least double the length of time that's good, that you think. So if you're saying, oh yeah, we'll do this in a month, it's going to take two to three months before you actually get to a point. Everyone's busy, everyone's trying to do full-time studying. And as a sort of, there is a sort of very much more rude quote of this, but I've watered it down. Um, but basically, if you are offered something and you're already quite busy, if it's not a hard yes uh, immediately, or you need to have a bit more to think about it. If it's not like a yes, 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 this will definitely help me. And it's something I'm really interested in, just turn it down. Um, you're just denying yourself the opportunity to do other work in the future and other opportunities that might be more helpful. Tip number four is perfect is the enemy of the good, which is a Voltaire quote, I didn't make it up. Um, project work, if you are doing it, is achieved much, much faster if you engage with the fact that, uh, and I can't remember what the stat is, and 70 or is that, quote about x percent of stats are made up anyway 70 percent of what you do will just be rubbish work anyway and the way to make sure that you actually produce good quality outputs is just rapidly iterating stuff so just get get from that blank sheet of paper to your be very basic first draft and just ping it back to your supervisor and just say look this is my first draft um i know it's not great at the moment but what do i need to work on and that's much better than fretting over sentence structure for weeks on end when actually you could have been pinging stuff back and forth and getting um getting it looking really really good um from that point of view so that's the way to do academic work and get your outputs much faster don't take it all on yourself to try and make something perfect tip number five is work out what narrative you want to build when you're building your cv build it for five ten fifteen years time don't view the sfp as an endpoint view it as a waypoint and that will mean that you put much less pressure on yourself and you're more likely to do meaningful projects that you want to engage in and will go on long term this is taken from a NANSIG webinar from 2020 uh, that I attended and um, I can't remember who the guy was, but this is a really, really good structure and I apologise that I can't attribute this to him fully. Um, but it's also helpful for interview structure as well. But just think about the three themes, the three areas that you're really, really interested in. So um, neurosurgery, technology, and innovation and global health for his, I suppose mine is sort of, uh, sort of clinical neuroscience, acute, um, acute care and sort of epidemiology and evidence-based medicine and then what domains clinically um, have you done and what would you like to do in the future what academically have you done and then what personal and actually curricular involvement have you had in it as well and if you do that um, it's a really good way of thinking through what you want and helping you gain direction in a way that you're going to be able to sell yourself your sort of dream job in the future Tip six is this, uh, I think this is Simon Sinek actually who wrote this, is work out your why and work out sort of why, like what you want to be and why. And I think the best way to do this is set, set your most outrageous possible expectation for your career in 15 to 20 years time. And like sort of if, if you have like 100 million pounds in the bank and you can engage in anything and everything you want and you've got loads of time, be as unrealistic as possible with that. I think if you want to be the chief, um, I don't know, the chief space medicine expert at NASA with an interest in intensive care and infectious disease. That's fine. Just be, be as unrealistic as possible as that. Um, because at the end of the day, engaging in those sorts of projects, you'll be interested in them first off. And then as the sort of opportunity sort of develop, you'll sort of forge, forge your own career path from there. Um, and it will also help you approach people. Um, having an online presence will help with that. And I think that is something that I'd think about um, but the, and, and be bold in who you approach as well. So the worst that could possibly happen is you'll be ignored or turned down and like you'll just move on from there. No one will reflect on that in 10 years time. Um, but just approach people, think about what you want to be and think about the most exciting possible job you could have that you currently think of and then just see how you get on from there. Tip number seven is diversify your outputs. And while we talked about not overcommitting yourself earlier, I think it's important to try and collaborate across a range of topics. Um, and if there are already projects going on in the department that you think you're interested in, ask about involvement. Um, diversification means you're not, it's sort of like investment really, you're not relying on one project in its entirety that might fall through, but lots of little projects that mean that well, you're sort of um, potentially more likely to get more output. And it will also give you more contacts and a broader skill set, which is no bad thing. But I think the way to think about which projects you want to engage in 
is am I doing it because I'm interested and will it help me build that narrative from tip number five and achieve my goals? Does the amount of anticipated effort justify the above two? Are you just being flogged by someone who's then not going to stick you on this sort of uh, authorship list? Does it give me transferable skills and does it give me any meaningful output? Or, or is it just a networking opportunity? Um, like is someone inviting you to go to a talk or something? And it, will, will it be helpful for you? And if you can sort of justify that to yourself and sort of continue engaging in the sort of stuff that's not a ridiculous amount of effort across a sort of broad range of topics at a fairly early stage, um, you'll start building a CV that's sort of really diverse and does give you all those skill set of sort of not only research, but also education and sort of leadership and management and various other domains from that initial CV thing. Tip eight is choose your supervisors wisely. Um, ultimately, your research and other output is going to be determined by a helpful supervisor because you are going to need their name on the stuff. Um, are they publishing regularly? Or if they're not, um, are they a sort of high up enough person that they have the contacts and the esteem? to be able to sort of publish. Speak to previous people that have worked with them or their current PhD students to see how difficult they find it to work with them. Um, or just, it, you'll get on with some consultants and registrars like a house on fire. But if you get on well with them, just speak to them about your interest and be frank with them and just say, Do you, and they'll, if they're not doing something, they'll know someone who is. Um, there are ways you can formalize this sort of relationship. So as a doctor, there is the Associate Principal Investigator Scheme under the NIHR. Um, and that essentially allows you to gain access in sort of research um, and sort of access to sort of skill sets and courses um, as, as a sort of doctor alongside sort of clinical work. I think tip number nine is uh, collaboration is key. Self-starting projects is very hard work and it's very, very inefficient a lot of the time. So as we said already, can you help a more senior colleague with an ongoing project? Are they doing audits that they need help with, like this um, RC site collaboration that I help with? Um, or have they got data that they're too busy to do or data collection that they are too busy to do? Because ultimately that's quite an easy, low skilled job. And if you can collect the data for them and then hand it to them and they do all this sort of analysis, even if you don't have the knowledge for that, you still will get an input and you'll still get, um, you'll still get an output even and you still get valuable skills. Um, but I think the important thing is you've got to be able to offer skills to the people you're approaching. And that's why intercalating is probably so important, in my opinion, just because of the sort of extra research skills you will get from that. And finally, tip 10, as I've said this already, opportunity begets opportunity. Engaging a project with a broad range of people opens more doors. Um, and if you take opportunities that align with what you want to do, you're more likely to come across people higher and higher up the field as you sort of become more and more engaged and get more and more output. Just take the opportunities and see where it takes you. And if you like, don't be afraid to drop stuff if you're finding it too hard work or boring, but just shoot the stuff that you're finding interesting. Um, just see where it helps you. And it's better than having a fixed route to your career goals in your head because you often end up just very disappointed. So just follow the opportunities. And if it's something that you're just accumulating more and more interesting stuff, just follow it and your career will develop from there, I think. Um, so I think going back to key messages, the, the top one is key. You don't need a good CV to get an SFP post and lots of people get them without any publication presentations or additional degrees. Follow your interests and you will get a brilliant CV regardless. Um, and just to engage and be bold and engage with a, at the highest possible level you can. Um, but just make sure that you're enjoying what you're doing and make sure that you're not doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, just to try and get a sort of uh, job in the future, because ultimately you may just end up completely unsatisfied with that job as well. Um, view the Specialist Foundation Programme as a waypoint to a future career, not the end goal of your CV. And like I say, you'll get more meaningful output that will benefit you throughout your career. And as we said, focus on doing the stuff you enjoy as part of the journey and the destination ultimately becomes more satisfying as a result. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to take any questions, as I'm sure the rest of the committee who are on the call are. Um, if you've got any questions or uh, feedback, please follow this link. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, and our next talk is next week, and it's on how to pick your AFP. Thanks. Maya has posted it in the group. Um, so, yeah, I will leave that there and see if anybody has any questions at all. Okay, I'll give it another minute and then we will uh, feel free to leave.
Uh, where do you find the conferences that are happening soon? So uh, the best way of doing that is uh, have a look at the national or international associations that your um, national or international associations that you follow um, or for the thing you're interested in. So um, my area of interest being sort of neuroscience is the sort of association of British neurologists, NANSIG, um, or just going on Twitter and following um, eminent people in the field. Um, so that's how I managed to know about things like the Brain Conference, which was um, run by um, run by the sort of Brain Journal and also uh, the Frontiers in Traumatic Brain Injury. Um, and that all just came from social media. So just uh, get on Twitter and follow them because that's often really, really helpful. Um, but yeah, so just summarize it sort of websites and sort of Twitter um, and you just sort of serendipitously find it. In terms of where do you find information on sort of deanery um, stuff? So just have a look on the website. So if you're interested in a deanery, I just earlier, I just went on Google and typed in Peninsula or Southwest SFP person specification or the other place to go is access the AFP.com and we have a whole thing on deanery selection um, and that will tell you where you're going. Um, and there's website links on there. Any more questions? No. Okay. Um, oh, so if I want to apply to SP languages such as Oxford or Cambridge, to what extent will not have an integrated degree affect my application? Assuming if I haven't. Uh, like I say, um, it's difficult to tell. You'll have to have a look on their website. Um, we don't represent specific sort of deaneries. Um, I think Oxford and Cambridge do probably place more emphasis on uh, research outputs, um, having, um, but I don't. I, I don't know personally the effect of not having an integrated degree, but like we've said um, already on this call, um, people have managed to get really, really prestigious AFPs without sort of traditionally ridiculous numbers of international publications and presentations. Um, so I think if you if you want to go there, go for it. Um, but if you're a bit concerned that you might not have the strongest CV, um, like I said, just go for the same thing as I did earlier, just go for a tactical application of go for the one thing that you really, really want and then go for something else that you don't um, that you don't think is as prestigious in sort of quotation marks, but uh, does still sort of fulfill your interests. Um, any tips on what to say when first reaching out to people via cold email if you've never done research before, like how to not undersell yourself? Um, I think it is just a case of saying, um, I think it's just being open with them and saying, look, I've I've read up on your area of research. I'm really interested in it for this reason and cite specific examples rather than giving anything sort of um, just sort of giving vague pleasantries. So um, and then just saying, look, I haven't done research before, but I'd really like to engage um, and I really appreciate even either just having a conversation with you or if you can point me in the direction of sort of things that I can engage with. Um, I think it's sort of contacting multiple people in a field will obviously also enhance your chances. So just speaking to multiple people, obviously it's a numbers game. And if you contact 10 people, you're more likely to get a response than if you just contact one. Um, but yeah, I think it's just being honest and just saying, look, I am interested, but I haven't got very much research experience. Can you give me any advice? Um, would I be able to sort of potentially come and uh, shadow in your lap or whatever? Um, and like I said, the worst thing they can say is no. Um, and the best thing they can say is, yeah, sure, come along. Here's a, uh, here's a link to a grant application. Um, I've just had a question. How many deaneries can you apply to for SFP or do you rank all of them like the normal foundation programme? Um, so you just apply to two. So you apply to two areas of application. Um, which, like I said, is the reason that tactical application is um, fairly important. Do we know if having e.g. one presentation slash apply slash publication count for a point? In other words, can five PubMed publications be counted the same as having an integrated degree? Um, you can sort of cross-reference from that sort of Northwest criteria, but that's just the Northwest. That's not a nationally national thing. 
Um, but like I say, it's about putting it all in perspective. So um, five PubMed publications probably will actually count for more than an integrated degree. Um, but um, like I say, it's all just sort of accumulating stuff that is going to help your application. Um, but it's impossible to say how the different deaneries score, unfortunately. But just have a look at the Northwest one if you are applying there, that obviously will be helpful. Um, but I think um, they probably will, if you're applying to places, have a look at the sort of um, uh, the sort of scope. So obviously an international, multiple international prizes is very helpful um, on top of an integrated degree, um, but it's impossible sort of, uh, they're not, you can't really compare like for like with them, if that makes sense. Sorry, I can't provide any more sort of clear answers. Um, would you advise starting with local conferences slash competitions and building up or going straight to national level? Um, I think um, I think it's just, uh, I think, like I said, it's just being bold. So uh, I think apply, do both. Just go for local conferences and competitions um, and try and send, send the stuff there because it will be helpful preparatory work for sort of national level in the future. Um, but if you want to do both, there's nothing to stop you doing both, really. Um, like I said, main message of this is you don't need any of that stuff on your CV. Just do the stuff, um, do the stuff that you want on your CV. Um, obviously, all the publications, presentations, prizes are helpful. Um, but just be bold in what you apply for. And ultimately, the worst that will happen is a rejection that no one except you will know about in about a year's time. And you won't care after the initial sting about a month later.